let us continue with our discussion of quadrature domains. <coughs> Let me just write down the definition one more time. <coughs> so, we will work with a domain <coughs> in the complex plane. <coughs> we will say that this is a quadrature domain for a test class, which I will take to be uh, the integrable holomorphic functions on omega <coughs> if the following conditions are satisfied. Number one, <coughs> there are finitely many points q1 up to qm <coughs> and uh, <coughs> uniform constants, fixed constants. Um, a, J, K such that if I take any <coughs> function in my test class and if I integrate this with respect to standard area measure, then this should be representable as a finite linear combination of evaluations at these points Q i's and I also allow some degree of freedom in taking finitely many derivatives. This is, let me be consistent with what I wrote last time. <coughs> so, this is the sum j going from 1 to m, <coughs> the sum a j k's, <coughs> k goes from 0 up to some integer r j minus 1 and I am taking so many derivatives at the point qj and this should be true for all f in my test class. Okay. <clears throat> so, just to fix some notation, uh, we will call each of these qi's as a node. So, this is a domain with m nodes and a quadrature domain is consisting of all this datum here along with the test class. So, I have to specify what the nodes are, I have to specify what these constants are and uh, what the test class is. <coughs> okay. So, last time <coughs> I said we will focus on one approach to understanding these. This was using the Schwartz function. Let me quickly recall what this was. <coughs> so, I am going to assume that <coughs> the boundary of omega is smooth real analytic curve. <coughs> so, locally uh, here is the situation. Um, so, let us work near a fixed boundary point namely the origin for example. I have a defining function with non-vanishing gradient. <coughs> And because rho is a real analytic function, I have a convergent power series which I can write in terms of z and z bar. <coughs> and uh, <coughs> because the gradient is non vanishing, this is going to have linear terms. So, this is 1 0 bar z plus c <coughs> 0 1 bar z bar plus higher order terms and because rho is a real valued function, it is equal to its conjugate. If I take the conjugate of each of these terms and if I equate rho and rho bar as power series, I get conditions that say that C10 bar is the conjugate of C01 bar and so on and so forth. So, in general, the conjugate of C alpha beta bar will be C beta alpha bar or something like that. Anyway, the, the, the moral here is that <coughs> Um, these, these coefficients are non-vanishing and that they are conjugates of each other here. So, <clears throat> by the implicit function theorem, uh, let us solve the equation rho equal to 0 as an equation of the form z bar is equal to s of z. Okay, so, I just start taking the holomorphic terms to one side. <clears throat> so, s is holomorphic near 0. 
and uh, <clears throat> last time you know we discussed three examples um, in which the Schwartz function um, had three distinct types of behavior. If I just take real line for example and if I write down what the Schwartz function for that is, I get um, an entire function, it's the identity in fact. <coughs> So real axis S for the circle <coughs> has a simple pole and the pole occurs exactly at the center Z equal to A and uh, for the ellipse uh, the Schwartz function was multiple value. Multivalued. Of course, it's multivalued globally. Okay, but as we had seen, uh, if you restrict attention to just a small neighborhood of the boundary, um, this is a well-defined function, whole model function, multivalued <coughs> globally. Okay. <coughs> Yes. So I was wondering, does it seem like this can be done in uh, Is this one good? No. Go up Oh, you mean the analog of the Schwartz function in high dimensions? No, not the Schwartz function as such. Oh. Okay, okay. Yes. 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 Actually, um, you can just uh, take a real analytic method and look at it as the decimal flow exponential map. Play the same game. Just take the one zero pi the power series function and you. Yes. Yeah. Or you could sort of complexify your your situation. It, that's exactly the same thing. Yes. So yes, go to yes. Koshi Kowalski. Ah, yeah, yeah. So right, good point, uh, Koshi. Uh, I have scribbled some lines here to that effect. So I'll I'll get to that point. So there's a different way to realize this Schwartz function uh, as a solution of a, a PD. So we will come to that. <clears throat> yeah, but Gautam, as you correctly said, I mean, if you, I just apply the implicit function theorem in, in many variables, I'll be able to express only, say, the Zn conjugate as, uh, as a function of the holomorphic and the n minus 1 conjugate coefficients here. So, that's the best we can do sort of locally. And, and this is the, I mean, this is the, 
the planar version of the Segre variety. So, this is the Segre variety here. Yes, 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 right. Yes. <laughs> yes, yes. <clears throat> okay, so let us continue with that discussion <clears throat> and then see how quadrature domains actually enter into the picture here. <clears throat> um, so here are some observations. <clears throat> so first of all, <clears throat> we could ask uh, <clears throat> for some finer properties of this Schwartz function locally. Um, for instance, what does the Taylor expansion of S look like near the origin? For example? So if you, if, you, if you go to the Taylor expansion of rho, and if you start out by pushing all the holomorphic terms here, you can actually identify what the linear term in S is going to look like. So S will have the form minus C10 bar Z divided by this constant here, plus higher order terms. But as you've already noticed, these two are actually complex conjugates of one another. So when I divide out by this, this coefficient here, the coefficient of the holomorphic term will have modulus 1 at the origin. So this is telling you, in fact, that S is uh, locally sort of like a change of variables. And in fact, the derivative has modulus 1 at the origin. The first observation, let's write this down. <clears throat> so, this is some e to the i theta. This has modulus 1. <clears throat> and as can be expected, uh, with some a little bit of work, <clears throat> um, you know, if you think of rho as just being a smooth arc in the plane, you can talk about uh, higher order invariants such as its curvature and so on. So for instance, the curvature of this function rho thought of as a smooth arc can be captured in terms of higher order derivatives of the Schwartz function here. So there's a very nice relation, but I don't need that at the moment, so let's not worry about that. <clears throat> I'll just make a statement. Um, higher order derivatives. <coughs> of S capture <coughs> curvature properties, curvature and other finer properties of <coughs> rho equal to 0. And just as a warm up, you could ask uh, the following questions. Well, if you look at the first example, uh, S was an entire function, the simplest possible entire function. So you could ask, suppose I give you a, a smooth real analytic curve. When is the Schwartz function an entire function? Yeah? So let's try and answer that question. Uh, you'll get a sense of what's involved here. So when is <coughs> S entire? Um, so to answer this question, let's define a new function. Let's define S tilde to be S of Z bar bar. So suppose S is entire for some curve. Let's look at this new function S tilde. This is also an entire function. <coughs> and uh, the claim is S tilde composed with S. <laughs> this is in fact the identity on, on the boundary. <clears throat> right? um, why is this true? Well, on the boundary, I know that S is equal to Z bar. So I'm looking at S tilde of Z bar. 
but S tilde of Z bar is exactly S of Z bar. But S of Z is Z bar on the boundary again. So if I take two bars, I end up with just Z here. Okay. So, uh, so this composition is the identity and therefore by analytic continuation this must be true everywhere. And this tells us that S is in fact globally invertible with inverse equal to S tilde which is defined by this recipe here. <coughs> so, <coughs> so S is invertible. <coughs> <laughs> and because I'm assuming this to be an entire function, what are the automorphisms of the complex plane? That's what this is asking me for. So S is invertible and hence an automorphism of C. So S must have a very special form. This must be AZ plus B for some A and B. And hence the boundary is exactly all those Zs such that S is equal to Z bar. In other words, all the z such that a z plus p is equal to z bar. And this is in fact a straight line. So global properties of S actually force the boundary to be very nice and simple. Now let's uh, relax this condition a little bit and ask when is S meromorphic on C. <clears throat> so I can play the same game, um, define S tilde and this of course you will realize as being the reflection in the arc as we discussed last time, right. So I am first taking the conjugate, applying S to it and then taking one more conjugate here. So if S is to be meromorphic on the entire complex plane, <coughs> um, so you are essentially asking for automorphisms of P1, um, linear fractional transformations and therefore the only case is and the boundary is a circle. So you will get something of this sort, nothing more is possible. So the moral here is that uh, we cannot put these global hypotheses because then the domains are very simple. <clears throat> All right. So what is the best uh, thing that we can do? Mm. So here's my domain. Um, I know that. S is defined in some um, neighborhood of the boundary. <clears throat> so I have S here and the boundary is defined by S of Z equals Z bar. <clears throat> All right. So now <clears throat> um, let's ask the following question. Now S is, is holomorphic in this region. I cannot assume that S is entire because then the answer is very simple. I cannot demand that this is meromorphic in the entire complex plane again because then the answer is very simple. So what I will ask is suppose that X, X extends meromorphically inside the domain. So what if S has ports? has a meromorphic extension to all of omega. I don't assume anything outside, um, but I am allowing continuation inside with the possibility of some ports, finitely many ports. <clears throat> so, um, so the question I am trying to pose is, is it in some way possible to identify what omega will be, just in the spirit of these questions that have been asked here. Okay. So the answer to this question is the following. The answer is captured in a proposition 
And this proposition gives us the first connection with quadrature domains as we have defined there. So take uh, omega to be um, bounded, simply connected. And uh, real analytic boundary, nicest possible situation. <clears throat> then S has a meromorphic extension to the entire domain omega if and only if <clears throat> omega is a quadrature domain and I have to tell you what the test class is. The test class is slightly different here. It's the class of all uh, <clears throat> uh, holomorphic functions that are continuous on the closure. So being a quadrature domain is equivalent to um, the Schwartz function admitting a meromorphic extension to the entire domain. Notice that these poles cannot cluster at the boundary because S is equal to Z bar, so S is well behaved near the boundary. Only finitely many poles. Okay, um, and just to give you an idea, uh, let's prove the easy part of the theorem. So sketch of proof. So I'll assume that S has a meromorphic extension. There are finitely many poles. Suppose the poles of S are, are at Q1 up to Qm. The following calculation will tell you that the quadrature identity is 1 which has all the nodes at the QIs. So these QIs are data that are coming to us from the Schwartz function. Yeah? They don't depend on the function f in the test class at all. So how does the proof go? <clears throat> so let's take uh, an element f in my test class. And let's integrate this function f on the domain. <coughs> so by Green, Green's theorem, uh, I can write this as 1 over 2i integral on the boundary of z bar f of z dz. <coughs> by Green's theorem. And now let's use the data that S is the Schwartz function for the domain omega. In particular, on the boundary of omega, S is equal to z bar. So I'm going to replace this term by S of z, F of z. Now we are almost done because we only have to evaluate this line integral taking into account the fact that S has a bunch of poles and F is harmless, there's nothing there. Um, so instead of integrating on the entire boundary, um, what you could do is, uh, you know, shrink this contour to a bunch of circles around the poles, expand S as, um, as a, as a Laurent series around each qj, so these are the qj's. So S is going to have a singular part plus a regular part and the regular part is not going to contribute anything but uh, the nice thing is that if you integrate f 
against the singular part, you'll have terms of the form 1 over z minus qi to some power. And I can use a Cauchy integral formula to evaluate this. And the output is going to be those many derivatives of f as the order of the pole here. Right? So putting all this together, the right hand side seems to be representable as a finite linear combination of evaluation at the qi's along with appropriately many derivatives. The number of derivatives is dictated by the order of the pole of s. Yeah. And what are the constants that come out? Harmless things like pi and all the, all the rest of it. So. Ah, so draw. So, uh, so the residue can be whatever it is. So S is going to look like uh, say something like this. You have z minus q j uh, some power here, say m, and on plus the regular part. Um, so these are the constants that are going to come. The right hand oh, so side. Those are derivatives. Those are derivatives. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly, exactly. And that's exactly our quadrature identity. That's what this is. <laughs> That's, that's what you get after integrating s times f. Yes, absolutely. Exactly. <clears throat> but as you correctly said, Rob, these, these coefficients, they don't depend on f. Uh, they capture terms like this, which are intrinsic to s. These depend only on. So that's your quadrature identity. <clears throat> okay. So, uh, <clears throat> so as I said, this is uh, the first connection uh, between the Schwartz function and the quadrature identity. Um, so, if your dopamine happens to be very nice, simply connected on all the rest of it. In other words, you can define your Schwartz function. Then your domain is a quadrature domain if and only if the Schwartz function extends inside the domain as a meromorphic function. That's the idea. Okay. But then uh, these conditions are, of course, very nice, but they're too restrictive in some sense. Um, so we would like to handle. Ah, hmm? oh, converse is, uh, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> right, right, right. How do you prove the converse? Mm. Yes. Let's let's think about this. Mm. Okay. 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 Right. So what you do uh, is you you start out by Assuming this quadrature identity, um, which means you have this data, the nodes with you, you create a rational function uh, in the following way. Um, you look at terms of this, right. you look at uh, stuff like this, <clears throat> ajk z minus qj to the power of um, k, something like this. Okay. 
And now the thing is, um, <clears throat> yes, 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 yes. So I can think of the right hand side as the integral of this rational function with f of z, the integral being taken on the domain omega here. Right? So this means that, uh, I think I have missed something here. Anyway, the, the, the point, so I don't remember the details, I'll just try to remember the thing. The idea is, uh, this identity sort of can be rearranged, I think I'm missing a z bar here. The idea is, every holomorphic function will then be orthogonal to z bar minus this rational function here. So this is a property uh, of the following kind. You have a rational function, you have z bar, z bar minus this rational function is orthogonal to all functions f in this class. Um, and this allows you to sort of extend uh, things inside. So your Schwartz function, which is z bar on the boundary, extends inside. This is what I vaguely remember. Yes. Boundary integral, right, right. Yeah, so, uh, right, I draw, as I said. Right, that's what we'll say, right, exactly. From this, you can say From this, I can say Yes. Z bar on the boundary, exactly. Okay. All right, so as I was saying, um, you know, those conditions are nice, but sort of too restrictive. So we would like to be able to work just with this. Well, um, so here is, um, here is what you do. <clears throat> Theorem. A general case. So take uh, domain omega <clears throat> and let's look at L1 holomorphic functions uh, such that <clears throat> star holds. We would like to be able to say something about the domain omega. So I'll write down the basic theorem here um, and then give you some details. So this theorem is due to Aronov and Harold Shapiro from the mid-70s. Hmm. So, for simplicity, I'll assume that omega is boundary. You don't really need this, but it's okay for our purposes. Uh, in, in that simple case, simple case, yeah. This, it need not be, it need not be, need not be, right. So, I'll make some comments on that as we move. This was only to highlight the connection uh, between the quadrature property and Schwartz function. That's all. <clears throat> all right, so the following are equivalent. Equivalent. Number one, um, omega is a quadrature domain. <clears throat> The, the Cauchy transform 
of the characteristic function of omega. <coughs> um, I will call this a C, C for Cauchy. Cauchy transform of the characteristic function is a rational function. <coughs> By this I mean there is a rational function R of Z <coughs> such that R is equal to C on the complement of the domain. I'll explain what the Cauchy transform is and how that enters into the picture. <clears throat> Number three, uh, there exists um, a function S, there exists S, which is holomorphic on the given domain, <clears throat> except for finitely many poles. in omega <coughs> and uh, s is equal to z bar on the boundary. <coughs> so point number three is exactly um, similar to our discussion of the Schwartz function except that uh, we have not made any assumptions on the smoothness of the boundary. So being a quadrature domain will force you to have a meromorphic function on the domain that's equal to z bar on the boundary. Continuously to the boundary, yes. S is continuous on, <coughs> on the extends continuously to extends. Well, continuously to the power. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, I'll just come. Okay, um, <clears throat> so just to recall, um, <clears throat> so I'm going to define my function C of zeta to be the integral 1 over z minus zeta and I integrate out the z variable. I integrate this on my domain T. <clears throat> So this is the characteristic function of omega and I am taking the convolution of this with the function 1 over z. So in general if I have an L infinity function say u, the Cauchy transform of u is exactly u divided by z minus z. So just convolve with 1 over z. So Pardon me? Yes. <clears throat> okay. Um. <clears throat> That's what this is. Okay, so let me just write down um, a useful lemma. Um, <clears throat> so first of all, the, the Cauchy transform as I have defined it here, in fact continuous on the plane and uh, it's equal to big O of mod zeta to the power of half as zeta goes to infinity. And uh, P of zeta is in fact equal to minus pi of zeta bar plus a holomorphic function. Let 
G is holomorphic on D on omega and continuous on the closure. <clears throat> yes, 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 yes. On omega. <clears throat> All right. Um, uh, this first statement is clear. This is convolution, one over z. D is bounded, integrable. Everything is nice. Um, big O of mod zeta to the half. Will you write this as the sum of two integrals? The first piece is taken on all those points z whose distance from zeta is at most zeta to the power of half and the second one is the complement. So I integrate on mod z minus zeta bigger than or equal to mod zeta to the half. Estimate each of these terms appropriately and I get this behavior near infinity. <coughs> and then uh, the third one also, uh, I think Grove, you discussed this in the problem session yesterday. Uh, um, so, <clears throat> the, the, the useful fact here is that if I look at the, the d bar derivative of C as a distribution, <coughs> this is minus pi times the characteristic function of <coughs> distribution weekly. Yes. So you're saying I pull this data out? Yes. <coughs> this is big O of mod zeta to the half, the first one. And the second one, well, uh, <coughs> you, you could do this. Um, right. So multiply and divide by z. Um, this guy is nice. I can integrate this. So I can bound the integral by the maximum of this, supremum of this. This is less than or equal to z minus zeta plus zeta. So this is like 1 plus mod zeta to the mod z minus zeta. And the region of integration is the distance from zeta is at least mod zeta to the half. So I get zeta to the half in the denominator. So this is also of this order. So this is what we get. <clears throat> okay. Um, right. So coming back to this. Um, so this is from yesterday's uh, problem session. Um, right. So if I define the function g to be the Cauchy transform plus pi times zeta bar, its weak derivative with respect to zeta bar is zero because of this fact. 
And therefore, by Weil's lemma, G must be holomorphic and all the rest of it. <clears throat> okay. Um, so with this digression, uh, let me give you some idea of the proof of this very basic theorem here, quartessential domains. <clears throat> Okay, uh, let's see. All right, so suppose you do have the quadrature identity. Let's assume statement number one. Let's try to show that the um, Cauchy transform is, is a rational function. Okay. Um, so what you do is, um, I choose a very special L1 function, which is holomorphic. So take your favorite zeta outside the domain, look at the function 1 over z minus zeta. Because your domain is bounded, this is an integrable function, it's holomorphic, so I can plug f equals 1 over z minus zeta here. On the left hand side, um, take zeta in the complement of the domain and take f to be 1 over z minus zeta, which is in my test class. So apply the quadrature formula here. <coughs> and this is equal to, <coughs> I have to compute what the right hand side is. The right hand side involves finitely many derivatives of the function 1 over um, z minus zeta. Yeah? So all the terms on the right hand side are going to be <coughs> monomials of the form <coughs> zeta minus qj to some power here, apart from some constants. So your right hand side. <coughs> is a linear combination of terms of the form <coughs> 1 over zeta minus qj to some power. <coughs> but this of course is exactly the Cauchy transform the Cauchy transform as a function of zeta, zeta is outside your domain, is in fact a rational function here. So this is your rational function, globally defined, it agrees with the Cauchy transform outside. Okay, so far so good. <coughs> Okay. Yes. Give me a moment. Um. <clears throat> I'm done with one implies two. Hmm. Okay. Um, let's just show that uh, 1 and 2 are equivalent okay. and then we'll worry about 3. So this is 1 and 2 is 2. Two implies 1. Okay. Um, So assume that your Cauchy transform agrees with a rational function outside your domain. Uh, 
the Cauchy transform is the integral of 1 over z minus zeta <coughs> on the domain d and um, <coughs> what can I say about the right hand side? Yeah. Well, let us see what happens here infinity. C has growth mod zeta to the half. So therefore, I have a rational function which has the same order of growth mod zeta to the half. Which means that if I were to write R as the quotient of a polynomial P divided by a polynomial Q, the degree of the denominator has to be bigger than the degree of the numerator. Because if not, then R will have at least, you know, um, um, a simple zero at infinity. And that's not possible because of this growth condition half. Okay. So this rational function is very special. Uh, the degree of the denominator is bigger than the degree of the numerator. In that case, I can use partial fractions to um, write this as a term of, as a sum of simple components uh, of this form, 1 over z minus zeta to some powers here. And therefore, <coughs> I can write R of zeta as uh, a certain distribution, let me call this alpha, acting on the function 1 over z minus zeta. What is this alpha? <coughs> alpha is uh, um, a finite sum of Dirac masses, point masses, <coughs> and their derivatives. So I'll, I'll repeat this argument. I, I write R as P over Q. Observe that the degree of the denominator is higher than that of the numerator. Use partial fractions to decompose this into finitely many terms. Each term is going to be of the form 1 over Z minus some Q to a certain power. Your distribution alpha is therefore going to be evaluation at those finitely many points. And whenever you have a, a degree in the denominator, that's going to be sort of like the derivative of the evaluation here. Okay? So that's where this alpha is coming from. <coughs> your, your measure. So this is good because now this is saying that uh, this is your quadrature identity, in fact. So the quadrature identity is true for very special functions of the form 1 over z minus zeta. Um, but then uh, uh, our test class is L1, then uh, an old theorem of Baer's based on an argument of Runge that this collection is dense in the class of L1 in the L1 norm. So I can take the limit, I can take the limit because this alpha is, is independent of what zeta is, what this function is. Alpha is uniform, so just take a limit in the L1 norm. Pass to the limit to get the quadrature identity. Let's worry about 3 now. Um, <clears throat> this is interesting because this is your candidate for the Schwartz function. How does this enter into the picture? <clears throat> um, let's look at 2 implies 3. Okay. So I have a rational function which agrees with the Cauchy transform outside my domain. <coughs> um, let's look at this new function. I'll, I'll stop in on it. <laughs> so, 
So consider <coughs> define s of z to be 1 over pi um, zeta, g of zeta minus r and this g is exactly the g from the lemma that I wrote down. Uh, remember the Cauchy transform is um, z bar plus a holomorphic charge, that's, that's the g. Coming from c of z. <clears throat> so look at this function. Um, and um, so this is meromorphic <coughs> on my domain omega clearly because g is holomorphic and r is rational. Um, <coughs> and on the boundary, what happens? On the boundary, <coughs> <coughs> um, so I'll write G as uh, the Cauchy transform plus pi of zeta bar, pi times zeta bar minus R of zeta. <coughs> These two are the same, this becomes zeta bar. This is true. So there you have it. This this is your Schwartz function. So this is exactly the comment which drawer made here. So on the boundary you have zeta bar, um, you are trying to fudge it by some rational function to make the whole combination holomorphic in the interior. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> and then now to complete the set of equivalences, uh, namely 3 implies 2. Um, we need one more ingredient. I will just state what this ingredient is. Uh, this is again in the same paper by Aronov and Shapiro. I will write down the theorem and prove it tomorrow. So omega is bounded. <coughs> Suppose f and g are meromorphic functions <coughs> that extend continuously to the boundary and take real values there, real values on the boundary. <coughs> then there is a polynomial <coughs> in the ring Rxy <coughs> reducible over C. such that <coughs> p of f of z, g of z is identically equal to 0 on d. So this is the statement that uh, any two meromorphic functions with this property are algebraically related. Once we have this, uh, we would be able to finish the proof of this theorem and uh, two extra lines will tell you that the boundary of a quadrature domain is in fact algebraic P equal to zero. Um, so I will stop here, uh, tomorrow I will give you the classical proof as mentioned in this paper 
Um, a very nice count counting argument, uh, very classical theory of Riemann surfaces. And then as we move on, I'll also give you uh, a different proof and time permitting one more proof of this fact here. Um, I'll stop here for the day.